Welcome to the second part of our long-term memory session in cognitive psychology. And I would like to start with a little introduction into long-term memory and like so oft with having a brief look at two Hollywood movies. First one is The Born Identity with Matt Damon and I ran into a little bit of um, issue with YouTube that they didn't like it that I was showing these video clips so let's see whether it works if I just make them very small. Okay, I hope that works. They were blank. Number two, Jason Bourne, The Bourne Franchise. I can't remember anything that happened before two weeks ago. An entire film franchise was built on the premise of a title character who couldn't remember who he was. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. None of it. And while Jason Bourne may have lost his memory, he still managed to retain some pretty lethal skills. Playing the highly skilled CIA operative who doesn't remember he's a highly skilled CIA operative. I, I can't tell you. I can't. I don't remember. You John Michael Payne alive. Thing. Matt Damon as Jason Bourne's training keeps him alive while he searches to uncover his identity. These people know who I am. I gotta, I gotta stay here. I gotta figure this out. This comes in very handy when he finds himself going up against multiple government agencies intent on killing him. I understand. And makes for a fast-paced and entertaining thriller all the way through. Before we unveil our... Okay, so Jason Bourne obviously has a memory problem and it's linked to long-term memory. Think about this for a second. What is what he can't do with his long-term memory? Okay, so another film I would like to present, also about memory, is Fifty First Dates. Let's have a look at this one. As long as we can, sir. Number nine, Lucy Whitmore, Fifty First Dates. I'm Lucy. In this slapstick romantic comedy, Adam Sandler struggles to answer the question, does it count as the friend zone if she doesn't even remember who you are? I think he's more than my friend. You're my boyfriend, right? Yes, ma'am. He plays a womanizer who gets bitten by the love bug when he falls for Lucy. Love is a very loaded word. <laughs> Played by Drew Barrymore, she's a young woman whose short-term memory loss keeps her thinking that it's always October 13th, 2002. This is ridiculous. I'm not paying for this. It's October. While Sandler's character is completely smitten and will do anything to win her over, Lucy begins each new day with a clean slate. Good morning. <laughs> However, just because she can't remember him doesn't mean she doesn't eventually fall in love with Sandler's character, which makes her character and the film all the more sweet. I was so nervous to come here and meet the guy that makes me fall in love with him every day. I just added two more guys. As long as we can, sir. Number Okay. The question is, from these two movies, what can we learn about memory? Jason Bourne had problems remembering his past, but he could form new memories. So he would create new entries into long-term memory. He was able to do that, uh, but he couldn't access the old some old memories while in this movie um, there was the ability lost to form new memories and long-term memory in the movie they said they said that it's a short-term memory loss but that's actually technically not not accurate if it's short-term memory loss these people really lose focus every couple of seconds and and it appears as if they wake up and what we can learn let me go back here. What we can learn from this is um, that there she seems to be two different systems. So we have retrograde amnesia and anterior grade amnesia. And this can be, so long term memory can be affected in different ways. 
Okay. Let's have a look. When we speak about memory, then um, it's always good to have a structure, a system behind that, because memory can be quite complex with a lot of different aspects and facets and so forth. And Squire proposed the following system. And a lot of people would agree to that, but I would just like you to make you aware that it's not the only way how we could describe and structure memory. And a big major distinction in the memory system, in the long-term memory system, is to have declarative memory. And this can be subdivided into semantic memory, about facts, and episodic memory, about events. And the other part is non-declarative memory. And this can be, for instance, procedural memory. This is skills and habits. For instance, that you learn how to ride a bike or learn to ski, things like that. This is procedural knowledge. Or priming and perceptual learning. So some people are uh, experts on wine, for instance, and they can taste very subtle differences because they have learned quite a lot and trained their their system. Simple classical conditioning, non-associative learning, these are all parts and this can be even sub further divided into emotional and skeletal rep responses. However, um, one might say these bits are not that cognitive they are very automatic in a lot of sense. We will speak about this in a later session on expertise, um, but in the, se in, in the context of long-term memory we will mainly look today at declarative memory. So let's have a very brief overview of declarative memory and just one slide on that. And declarative memory in general refers to knowledge which we have about facts, which is then called semantic memory, and about events, so actual things which have happened to us, and this is then called episodic memory. In declarative memory, recall is conscious. So when we try to remember what's the capital of Poland, then this is a conscious process when we get this um, memory. In procedural memory, for instance, how to learn a bike, how to ride a bike, that's usually not conscious and you will see that people often struggle quite a bit to explain exactly how to do that. How exactly do you keep balance on a bike? That's very hard to put into words. So this is a major difference between declarative and um, non-declarative memories. And because recall is conscious, it's sometimes also called explicit memory and the procedural memory then implicit memory, but uh, declarative and non-declarative are currently the more preferable terms. <clears throat> and the information which we recall from our declarative memory is usually like stored or you may say loaded into short-term memory and then we may work with that information, we may manipulate this information in our short-term memory or working memory. Let's have so, so much for just the declarative memory in general. Let's have a look at the semantic memory about facts. And the semantic memory, in there we store general knowledge about the world. So this is really factual knowledge which we have here. It's also concepts and it's schemas, scripts. And we will go through these different things a little bit step by step. Let's turn that a bit further down. So, facts. These are the most basic units of semantic memory and are things like London is in England, London is the capital of England, things like that. England is in Europe. And this type of memory may be established immediately. You may hear something once and it's stored. In particular, if it's about names of people you continue to meet, for instance, or certain facts which you find interesting, they may be stored in a single instance. So facts are the basic units of knowledge, and concepts it's, it's a little bit more abstract. And 
a concept oh yes concept is a mental representation of categories of objects or items so it's a more abstract version an example is here it's a concept of a tree so the the idea of a tree is an abstract concept it's basically a generalized and simplified form of of this category of objects and what it does is it allows us to identify and categorize new things which we have never seen before because when you go through a wood for instance there are so many trees you have never seen before but you can still identify them as trees even if you go to another continent and they are completely very different types of trees then again you can categorize them and for that usually um, the concept is based on simplified features which are required to be present for instance a tree may have this green elements and crown um, not necessarily in winter but we need to know that we know that in principle it can be there and then it has the stem the trunk of the tree if we see something green and there's no big trunk it might be a bush but not a tree and having these concept is really a prerequisite for higher level thinking because if we can't make this ab abstraction then it's, it's difficult to talk you know like I have seen a tree somebody else says I don't know what a tree is something like that but different it's, it's challenging concepts may also be about abstract things for instance the concept of freedom and the concept of freedom may be um, something generic um, of the concept of that I can say what I want to do, that I can go where I want to do, that I can do what I want to do, of course all in limits, but to illustrate that you have these individual things, items, thoughts, um, abilities, which they then can be generalized. Now a schema is um, an even more abstract memory structure which organizes information and how these different bits of information relate to each other. I think it will become clear if we see an example in a moment. You may also say it's an organized packet of information about the world, for instance, about people, events, or things. And an example is we just had that uh, we just learned that tree is an example for a concept but forest would be an example for a schema because in the forest different concepts like the concept of tree the concept of plants the concept of animals are put into relation to each other so for instance if I just see deer in a zoo on its own I'm not saying oh I'm in a forest it must be deer in the context of trees with other plants so you know you get this um, organized packet of information in a structure which helps us to to organize this and these schemas are built on past experience we just learn them and they are actually quite important because they organize our perception and Brewer and Trains did a quite interesting study and in this study participants came to the lab to participate in an experiment and they were put into an office and said okay please wait for a moment until the experiment starts and then they were introduced invited and said okay the experiment starts now and put into a neighboring room and there they then were without expecting that asked for items they have seen in the office where they just waited to start the experiment and what is interesting is that people sometimes reported items which were actually not present in the office but would perfectly fit the standard schema of an office and they deliberately left out certain items which you would usually find in offices as an example books there were no books in this office where they had to wait but quite a few people reported 
oh yeah, I saw books. And so just knowing that we are in an office helps us organizing our perception. The same holds a little bit for if we can't identify exactly what an item is. It's much more likely if, if it has an ambiguous interpretation that we interpret it in a way which fits the schema we are just in. And these schemas are quite relevant, for instance, in the context of eyewitness testimonies, because the, eye, the, the testimony may be tainted by this. You know, if you see two people fight, you may be inclined to see a weapon because weapon might be part of the schema of a fight. and But maybe you haven't seen something. The problem is, these people really thought they saw that. It's not that they just make that up and you say, you, you made that up, did you? Did you? And say, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, I thought maybe there was one. They really believe that. And the final structure or, or memory unit I would like to present are scripts. And scripts are schemas for sequences of events. So a schema puts together different concepts and a script puts expected behavior for a given situation in a sequence. A classic example is restaurant dining and this has been often used in um, in research. And most people have a good idea of the script and it's a very nicely scripted activity. So you come to a restaurant, you sit down, you are given the menu, you order your food and your drink, you then eat and drink, you pay the bill and you leave the restaurant. So that's a very prototypical thing. However, this is also a good example how we learn these memory structures like concepts, schemas and scripts because there's quite a bit of cross-cultural confusion here in the sense that in some countries, like the UK for instance, you usually wait at the entrance, at the door of the restaurant, to be seated. While in other countries, for instance more likely in Germany, you just enter the restaurant and you find your own empty table. That differs a little bit on the restaurant, but it's much more common than in the UK for instance. So sometimes you see people just going to a table and you think, oh, they are rude. No, they're not rude. They're just coming from a different country. Or the other way around, people standing lost at the door and people are wondering, what are they waiting for? Why don't they take a seat? So this is important to keep in mind that these scripts are learned and influenced by the culture. Okay, so to summarize that, Facts are the most basic units in our de semantic memory and an example of a fact is a tree is a plant. Then we have concepts which are like categories of things or ideas. The concept of a tree we have seen. Then we have schemas, even higher, which organizes these pieces of information and their relationship among each other. And we have the example of the forest. And scripts are schemas for events. So again, different activities, different behavior is put into a relationship and a sequence. And the example was restaurant dining. And all these things are essential for understanding, as I said already, eyewitness uh, memory or eyewitness testimony. And they're also relevant for language processing because um, different languages may be uh, may may favor the creation of certain concepts or different concepts. And, and one reason is that they are the basis for implicit assumptions. Think of the office study um, and people from pers people from a different cultural background may have different implicit assumptions what are typical elements of an office for instance. Okay, if you have any questions please put them onto um, the discussion board on BBL.